All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray for your anointing to teach and preach it. Lord, glorify yourself. Speak to us, Lord. Thank you for ears to hear, Lord, and eyes to see, and minds, Lord, to understand and hearts to believe for your glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, my brethren, dearly, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And then he started, to, and this is not the message, but he speaks to a couple of ladies in the church. I beseech you, odious. Beseech is like a nice way of saying, you know, I'm pleading with you to do this. And Yodius is actually a, a word that means fragrant. So he's talking to fragrant, Yodius. He says, I beseech Yodius, and then he says, and I beseech stinky. Stinky. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sintichi. <laughs> <laughs> that they be of the same mind <laughs> in the Lord. So he's, he, I mean, Paul, right here in the scripture, he's writing to this church of two women that can't get along, and he's telling He's telling them, you know, fragrant and stinky, get along. You, you two. I mean, they were, they were probably the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? But he's telling them to get along. Actually, that name means, uh, means my fate. Kind of like that one. And he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. And, and it's true, w women do an awful lot to work in the gospel. And usually in most churches, there's more women involved than there are men. True. Uh, but I, I believe that's going to change. I believe they're going to both be involved in, in our new endeavor. Uh, but he said, uh, uh, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, which Clem with Clement also. And Clement historically is believed to be the, one of the first pastors of the church at Rome. And the, I remember going to Catholic church and hearing his name mentioned in the masses because they would mention certain people that were spoken of in the scripture to definitely have been saved, so they make them saints immediately, right? Because, you know, the Catholic Church, you have to pass a test to become a saint. And, uh, but Clement, since he says here, with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And so they prayed to the saints and to Clement and to the different one. And so we know that Clement it was a saint of God in heaven. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Now this is what I want to start talking about here in the scripture. And I guess we can call this uh, the Christian's mental and emotional health. He, Paul says here to rejoice in the Lord always. Now we, we must remember that, of course, Paul is uh, probably imprisoned at this time that he's writing this. So he, he was a guy that had a lot of reason to be unhappy. Uh, but he was not known to be a complainer. He was, he was a person who expected there was going to be trouble in this life, expected persecution, expected difficulties. And, and he actually said that, uh, that he exulted in those things. That even if there was persecution or tribulation, uh, he, he said that you know, those, those things uh, furthered his trust in the Lord rather than weaken them. And so he says here, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now this word rejoice here means to be cheerful, calmly happy, be glad, but it also means to be joyous and rejoice exceedingly. So it's a word, and I'm, I'm kind of glad it doesn't mean, you know, be hilarious 24 hours a day. Right. You know, because who, who could keep that up, Right. Uh, and so it deals with all of the time. There's times that we are to rejoice exceedingly, and there's also a, a time that we can be cheerful and calmly happy. Now, most people today uh, are, are facing a lot of pressure. We live in a pressure cooker of a society. Yeah. Uh, and it seems to be from the top to the bottom, to the, from the, the well to the sick, from the rich to the poor, everyone is under a pressure cooker. There's something going on in people's lives that, uh, that put the pressure on them. And, uh, and it seems to accelerate. The United States of America is a place where there's a, you know, we live a very comfortable life. 
But so many people can't enjoy the comfortable life that they live because they're always thinking about the next day and the demands and the problems and uh, the troubles and you know the the boss or the kids or the grandkids or the husband or the wife or the neighbor or the war or the sickness or the, whatever it is. There's a lot of pressure on people today, and uh, and the way that Americans escape it seems from the pressures of life is TV and you know music and the movies and books and things like that. I don't, I don't know if people read as many books as they used to, but they probably do. Because Amazon book business is a big deal. Uh, but people like to escape from the pressures of reality by being coming distracted with things to take their mind off of things. Uh, and uh, I, I was reading about, I was looking up the, the side effects of, of some of the medications that they give to people who are anxious and nervous. And I, and I looked at one particular drug and and I even forget the lip to something or I don't know what they meant. Not that I'm taking that, I'm not, I'm just, I was just looking for others. And, uh, and some of the side effects of these things was that can make you angry, can, can make you afraid, can cause uh, the side effect of, of having suicidal thoughts, could keep you up at night, all these things that go on. The things that are, the things that the, the the stupid pill is supposed to stop you from having are the side effects. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and it's listed under common side effects. So it happens to a lot of the people that take it, you know? Uh, and so we live in, a, in a, also in a society that likes to medicate and, and to take care of the stresses through pills that kind of suppress things. I was reading about uh, the brain, and they say that th there has to be a chemical balance inside of the brain there, there has to be serotonin and, and another thing called GABA, G-A-B-A, and they have to be in balance. And if they're not in balance, they, they say that these two things are kind of like a speed uh, restrictor for the thoughts. They, it's like a speed limit for thoughts. They hold the thoughts from, from taking off and going crazy because people have all kinds of thoughts going on in their mind. And, uh, and, and if the serotonin or the GABA is not at the levels and if it's out of balance, then the stresses and the worries and the pressures of people, they can't sleep at night, their, their minds run wild, the pressures, and, and, and it's just amazing what people, that people go under. So people get on medications or they, they get into things that distract them uh, or they, you know, they fall apart. Those, these are the pressures of life that people face today in a modern society. Um, Insomnia is a big problem with people because when the, when the mind goes crazy worrying about things, uh, one of the big problems is money. People worry about money and they can't sleep thinking about money. Uh, health, another thing. And uh, that the, 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 the thoughts go crazy. Uh, when I say go crazy, I don't mean insanity. I mean that they just take off. That's a, that's a New York saying. You know, he was, he was running like crazy, you know. And their thoughts were just running like crazy in their head, you know. Uh, at full speed, I should say. Uh, and uh, but anyway, uh, now, now they have na natural things that help people to balance the melatonin and the GABA, and the people are reporting that they're, they're calmer and good things like that are happening. Uh, but people are struggling with anxieties today in our in our culture. It's very common. It's difficult on people. It affects families. It, it affects marriages. Uh, it affects health, it affects many, many things. Now the scripture, is, and, I, and I heard a preacher say this on, on TV. I heard him say that, um, I think it was T.D. Jakes, maybe it was a T.D. Jakes or somebody else, I don't know. Uh, but, but he said that thoughts, that, that <coughs> psychologists say that when you, you entertain a thought in your mind, that within 30 seconds, if you have 30 seconds to deal with it, and if it's a negative thought, if you don't get rid of it in 30 seconds, it translates into a feeling, and it affects the emotions, you know? And, and, I, and I immediately thought of a scripture, casting down imaginations, and everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Why do you have to cast something down? That means deal with it quick. Yeah. Thoughts that 
that are not of the Lord, that are not in agreement with his word, that, that are not a good thing to entertain in your mind, that this book of Philippians talks about how, how to think. And I'm not even going to get to these verses, but it says here, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's, that, that's the command of the scripture for mental and emotional health for Christians. We have to think on those things. So that means that when the negativity comes in our mind, we have a few seconds, according to the psychologist, to cast it down before it becomes a feeling. And then feelings are much more difficult to deal with because the emotions. The Bible speaks about the mind and the heart. The mind is, in the scripture is, I believe, the word... Uh, uh, might be suke, and it has to do with the thoughts. But the heart is the word cardiac, where you get, you know, cardiac arrest and, you know, the car cardiac system or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and, and it means that your thoughts and your feelings, thoughts and feelings. God is interested in our thoughts and feelings. I'm the kind of a person that feels like, well, you know, if God said it, I don't care what I feel like, and that's a good way to be. I'm going to go by what he says rather than how I feel, because his word is settled forever in heaven and it, it trumps my temporary feelings that change like butterflies flying away coming or going you know our our feelings are just based on the chemicals the meal we had the day we're having our age you know, how our day is going the weather our circumstances we can feel things all, based on all kinds of different temporary things what somebody said to us how somebody looked at us you know and it affects everything uh, but God's word is eternal and it's settled forever in heaven. So I, I personally think, well, I don't go by feelings. I go by faith. And when I pray for things, I go by faith and not by feelings. Okay? Because we have to have faith in God. Yes. When we let our feelings interfere with that, we're literally <laughs> saying to God, Lord, I have more faith in how I feel than what you said. And it hurts us from receiving what God wants us to receive. Uh, and so anyway, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, always, of course, means always, right? It means always. It means all the time. And I, let me tell you, I've had some days when it's hard to rejoice. It's hard to have a happy feeling and be cheerful and calmly happy and be glad and rejoice. And, mm -hmm. and I'm certainly not going to dance and shout. You know, sometimes there's pressures on us. Uh, and, and that's when we have to, uh, you know, there are, there are other verses that deal with days like that. For instance, where it says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Uh, there, there's times we have to come before the Lord and take the weights of our cares. That's, that's a word that means anxiousness. And just say, Lord, uh, based upon what you have said in your word that I know who you are, I'm going to give to you these, these anxieties and these stresses and these pressures. And I'm going to cast them on you, Jesus. You take them. Jerry Brumson was a guy who did that very well. Yes, he did. I mean, he, you know, he would just say, well, the Lord will take care of it. His family came up there and they had all kinds of problems. He'd just say, well, the Lord will take care of it. The Lord will take care of it. And, uh, and he, I, I heard him say that many, many times about things. Uh -huh. He didn't worry about things. He was a guy who was full of faith. He was a guy that studied the Word, so he knew what God said. And if you don't know the Scriptures, then, then you may find it more difficult to cast your cares on him because you don't know God's opinion about what you're casting. But if you know what the scripture says about the topic that you're dealing with, then you can claim that particular verse and you can pray about it and pray through it and pray into it and then give it to the Lord and come away with peace. Uh, and and once, once we unload on God, we have to leave it with him and not take it back. Because sometimes we give our cares to the Lord, then we take it back based upon maybe how we feel. But we have to give it to him and keep it there. So he says this in verse 5. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. That means as believers, we should always be in a unfake, I'm not talking about being fake, a, a cheerful, calmly happy, glad or joyous or exceedingly rejoicing condition. Uh, that, that comes from our relationship with him. Right? Then the next verse says this. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, so moderation is an interesting word. Ipikasi. That's the worst Greek you've ever heard. 
<laughs> but, but it means this, mild, gentle, and patient. And I have to confess to you that I, at times I fall short of, of that, you know? But it, it tells us that let your moderation, let your mildness, your gentleness, your patience be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, and, and, and so uh, actually our calm demeanor, our, our peace, our calmly happy and cheerful demeanor becomes a witness to people around us. Because hopefully we've told them about Jesus. And if they see us unhappy and miserable and stressed out and not able to, you know, get over the hump of the things that, they, that we deal with in life, just like they can't, they think, well, what, what benefit is it to knowing God? They got the same problems we do, you know? And so he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, <laughs> and so... Well, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago, and Jesus didn't come the week after that. So what did he mean by the Lord is at hand? Well, Jesus said to his disciples, and you go preaching, say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Yeah. And so he's simply saying here that you can be mild and gentle and patient, first of all, because God's watching us, and we're accountable to him. So we better treat people right, you know, and we better be mild and patient and calm because we're gentle with people because we hope he will be that way with us. And whatever we sow, we reap. Yes. So if we're impatient with people, if we're not gentle with people, uh, then how can we expect to turn around to the Lord and say, would you be that way with me, please, uh -huh. sir? You know, uh, the, the Lord is at hand that way. The Lord is at hand also to meet our needs, to care for us. Mm -hmm. And so we have a reason where we can be at peace. Because the expression of mildness and gentleness and patience is, is, is an expression of our inner peace that we have, that we know that God's taking care of our issues, our problems. There's nothing too big for God to handle. He can handle anything. Uh, and he can handle it well. And the scripture says, actually, he, he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think. And he says he can do it by the, the power that works in us. Isn't that it? Oh, so the Lord is at hand. Yes. He's, just, he's so close at hand, he's in us. Oh, yes. All right, and so the next verse says this. Be careful for nothing. And that doesn't mean when you drive, drive crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 there's a police officer here, and he'll hear. <laughs> but it, it, means, it means literally, don't be anxious. Uh, don't allow your thoughts to take control and give you anxiety. Be careful. And, and he didn't say, you know, be, don't be worried about some things. You know, save them for the big stuff. You ever hear the expression, don't sweat the little stuff? Yeah. Okay. Not, not a bad bit of advice. But you can also add to that, don't sweat the big stuff either. Uh, because he says, be careful, don't be anxious about anything. Be careful for nothing. Okay? Be careful for nothing. The Lord is at hand. Jesus is right there to take care of us. He's going to be with us. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, he said. The Lord is with us. And Paul was a guy who could say this stuff because he was a guy who was beaten, flogged, left for dead, uh, you know, chased around, persecuted, put in prison, shipwrecked a few times. Can you imagine being on a ship that's sinking out in the midst of a, of a hurricane or something in some storm in the ocean at night? No. Uh, not even a modern ship. I mean, and for him to gather together the crew and tell them, the Lord stood by me. Don't worry, guys. We're going to lose the ship, but you guys are going to be fine. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. The ship's going down, but I'm going to be fine. How's that going to work? The ship's going down, you know. But it, it happened exactly like he said. The, the ship went down and they floated to shore holding on to pieces of wood in the middle of a storm at night. That'll comfort you, won't it? <laughs> and, and he got there to the island there and, uh, and the kindly natives met them and made a fire for them. And Paul, you know, you'd think the guy would, would be suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. He, it, well, he'd been through. But no, he's up helping gather wood for the fire. You know, he wasn't just sitting there 
you know, uh, just sh in shock from what he'd been through. He's helping gather wood for the fire, picks up a wood, and a venomous snake latches onto him. And so he shakes it off into the fire, and the people looked at him and said, this must be a bad dude, because if the, the storm didn't get him, that snake's going to get him, because nobody lives after that snake. They expected him to just fall down and die in a few seconds, you know. And nothing happened. Then they said, well, he's a god. Because if that snake can't kill you, you got to be a god. <laughs> so, uh, but, but see, Paul was a guy, he wasn't worried about it. Because Mark chapter 16 says, he knew the word, you know. And the, the, the gospel of Mark said, they shall drink any deadly thing and take up serpents and it shall not har harm them. So Paul said, oh, I, Lord, I know what you say about this. Just shake it off in the fire. I'll be fine. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't anxious about what he was going through at the moment. That's a bad day when you get shipwrecked and bit by a venomous snake all within the, the same hour. You know? I would say so. and, and after they had been going through the storm for days. Uh, so when he writes this stuff, you can kind of say, well, okay, I can take this from Paul. The guy has credibility. You know, he, he practices what he preaches. He lived out this thing. He can do it. Be careful for nothing. Uh, don't be anxious. Don't be troubled with cares and worries. Mm -hmm. and, and another, listen to this, another definition of this word anxious also means, or carefulness, which, which means anxious. It, it means anxious, but also means to seek to promote one's own interests. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it means to seek to promote one's own interests. So in other words, don't be anxious about your troubles and don't be anxious about your, your plans and, uh, and all of the grand things that you feel that you deserve, okay? You, don't, you didn't get the promotion? Well, don't worry about it, okay? You didn't make as much money as you thought? Well, don't worry about it. That, that's, that's not on you, Okay, you might have an agenda that, you know, you feel like that you should have been someone great by now or further along than you've been. Don't worry about it. It's all right. God sees you. He loves you just the way you are, you know, and, 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 uh, and so don't worry about it. He, he's got this. And, you know, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. In other words, if God wants to promote you, he'll do it whenever he feels like he wants to do it. And if that means never... That's okay too, yes, right? That's right? Because God is in control. Be, be careful for nothing. Don't seek to promote yourself. Some people are driven in their life. They have to get ahead. They have to reach their goals. They, they have, what do they call it when you have a lot of uh, desire to get ahead? You ambition. Have, ambition. I couldn't think of ambition. That, that happens when you're 64. But, you know, if your ambitions aren't being satisfied and you're not where you think you should have been, don't let that ruin your life. Yeah. That's right. You're not living in as fancy a house as you thought. Don't worry about it. Paul said, I've learned that whatever state I am, to there be content. And that, that's the Christian's healthy state of mind. That we are, the Lord is at hand. Wherever I am, I'm with him. It's good. It's all good. You know, with Jesus, it's all good. Praise the Lord. I remember being in college and, uh, and with a roommate. I thought I was a religious fanatic, and he was uh, gay, and I preached to him all the time, and he used to say, stop it, you're scaring me. And, 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 my, and I was on this side of the room, and he was on that side of the room, and I had a metal closet, he had a metal closet, and we had to go out of the room, you know, for the, for the bathrooms and all of that, Iowa State University. And, and we were there in the room, and uh, I want to tell you, I had a wonderful time with the Lord, you know. My, my biggest heartbreak was I missed my dog, <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> I, I, shed a, I shed a few tears over Sandy. And, and uh, I missed my dog. My parents, I was okay with getting out of there because they made my life hell for two years because of Jesus. So I was so glad to be gone. And of course, you know my parents later on, they, they love the Lord, you know. They, they, were, yeah. they were to the Lord's glory of winning them to Christ. But I was out, I was free, I didn't have to listen to all of their yap, yap, yap in my ears about being a religious fanatic and following Christ and believing in Jesus. And, 
whatever. <coughs> and, and, uh, and, and unfortunately, the, the, my roommate went home every weekend, so I had the place to myself on the week. I, I was very happy. And I'm telling you, if you could be happy in, in half of the room, <laughs> you could be happy anywhere, yes. okay? And it's not like I had a comfortable bed, it was like a bunk. And that's what we slept on, and I was perfectly happy. I had a couple of Christian friends. I got up at four in the morning to pray every day, and I just had a wonderful time. And, and we can be joyous no matter what condition that we're in. If, if we don't have expectations that we're living in, we live in our expectations of the future. You know, we're all excited about where the church is going in October. That, that's a good thing, right? And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning I'm meeting with uh, Pastor Tommy Zito. We're having a meeting. We're discussing things and about the future. He's in town. And, and before he leaves again, he wanted to get together with me. So it's perfect timing. I was just wondering whether he was going to connect, connect with me. And it's going to be tomorrow. And I'm, I'm excited about seeing souls saved and the church going ahead and God's agenda. But I'm excited about God's agenda. I'm, I'm not thrilled about my own agenda. Because I'm 64. I wouldn't mind, man, if I can retire next year. 65 years old, isn't that? Doesn't it say in the Bible somewhere at 65 you retire? Yeah. I think it says it there somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Hezekiah, what was it? Hezekiah 4 7? Yeah. yeah. 65. I, I wouldn't mind just, you know, just taking an easy street, but. But I know that that's not what I'm alive for. I'm alive to preach the gospel and to teach the word of God and to further the kingdom of God. And so I, I'm not even concerned about the future of the church. It's God's agenda. It's in his hand. I'm going to follow it as it comes because it's for the Lord and for his glory. Amen. Amen. And, you know, and the connection that we made with Pastor Tommy Zito and us is, I believe, a divine connection. And it shows me that the Lord's not done with us yet. And we've got more to go in this church, and we're going ahead. We're going to move ahead. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be work involved, but we're going to do whatever it takes for the glory of God and for the winning of souls. Uh, when you think about it, folks, we're saved already, right? I mean, we can all die today, go to heaven, and be just fine. Uh, but why doesn't the Lord take us all home like he did Jerry? I guess Jerry's work was done, you know, and the Lord took him, and, and he's with Jesus. Uh, well, because there's more work for us to do. Yeah. Like Anthony said yesterday, we got to step up to the plate now and take up the slack mm -hmm. and, and do what needs to be done for the Lord. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, not, we're not anxious about our futures, about ourselves. Am I going to have money? Am I going to have nice clothes? Is, am I going to have a nice car? Am I going to have a nice house? It's all in God's hand. It's all provided for. He provides for us. He provides for all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I know I'm blessed with more than I ever expected to have in my life. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I was born to a bunch of people that were born in the Bronx in New York, and they, all my relatives lived in little apartments in the city. My grandparents on, on my father's side never drove a car because they, they'd walk out of the apartment, get into the bus, and go where they had to go to church. Catholic Church, my grandmother went every morning, uh, or to the job, or to the grocery store. They took the bus, they came back, that's how they lived their lives, and they went up the elevator to their little apartment that they lived in their whole, just about their whole married life, those old buildings. And then my, my father's sister got an apartment right there in that same apartment building, and so we can go visit Grandma and Aunt Rosemary at the same time, we lived in the same building. And the apartments were almost like identical. And uh, it was just that you walk in the front door, there was a little kitchen over here, and then you walked into uh, a little living room here, then you walked past and there was a little bathroom there, and then you walked a little further, and there was a little bedroom, that was it. And, uh, th and they had a TV, and my grandfather was always planted right in front of the TV watching the baseball game, smoking cigars. <laughs> and he would call me Bub, he'd say, come here Bub, come here Bub, and I, was, I, I I dreaded that because that meant he wanted me to sit next to him. He put his arm around me, but that smoke, the stink of that cigar, <laughs> got all for me. But I, I was, I, I listened, and I, you know, I, I love my my grandpa. We called him Grandpa, and his name was Anthony Ricci also. Uh, he died at 67 years old uh, from cancer, and uh, but 
you can be happy wherever yeah, you are yeah. when you have yeah, Jesus. Absolutely. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you. So he says, be careful for nothing. Don't be troubled. Gives all, cast all your cares and your worries about him. It, it, it doesn't mean that we are pressured to be anxious, because we are. We are pressured to be anxious. But, but there is an obvious solution. It's the next verse. Here's what he says. Be careful for nothing, the same verse, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then he says, and and I'll, I'll explain that process. Then he says, and the peace of God, which passes all understandings, will keep your your cardia, that's your heart, and your mind, which is your noema. Mind is noema, which means your thoughts and your perceptions. And so the peace of God, when you do this thing, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it is not based upon your circumstances. As a matter of fact, it's not even based upon any, anything that you can think, I have good reason to be peaceful. When you, I understand that I have good reason to be peaceful in my mind based on my circumstances. It's beyond that. It's not based on what you can think about. It's not based on your own thoughts. You might think, if you start thinking, what happens? If you don't cast down the negativity, if you don't think on the things that are good, honest, just, pure, lovely, good reports, virtue, praise, if you don't think on those things, then they'll start to produce feelings in you. And when those feelings come up, then your day is messed up. Then your your thoughts run away like crazy because feelings are, are difficult to deal with. Uh, let me tell you, feelings are important. Mm-hmm. They really are. Yeah. Do you know, it, it says here that we have the hope of the glory of God mm-hmm. in the scripture. Yes. The hope of the glory of God. What does that mean? We have the hope, the expectation of in our future that we're coming into the presence of God himself. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. Yeah. God created feelings because God is a God who feels he, he's not the Wizard of Oz, the big machine, okay? He's not a, a, a supercomputer. He's a person. He has a heart. He feels. David was a man after God's own heart. David wrote the Psalms. I, I want to give you all today an assignment. And you can accept it or not. It's up to you. But if you do accept it, I'd like, like to see what you do with it. The assignment I want to give to you is to write a psalm. Mm. Wow. To the Lord. Write a song. Express your heart to God's heart. Speak to Him wherever you're at. Like just like David did. If you need to refresh yourself in the Psalm, read through the Psalms, see how David did it. He was an expert psalm writer. And then just go and go ahead and write your, your thoughts. It doesn't have to be, you know, it sounded just like David. He lived in a different time than we do. Uh, but you can express your heart and your thoughts for today. Uh, that, that, that should be something that can be done during our prayer time, during our devotion time. And, uh, and if you haven't had much of that lately, well, this will be a good excuse for you to start back on the right track and get into what you're supposed to be doing in your relationship with the Lord. To pray and to seek the Lord and let your heart express adoration and thanks and, and worship and petition, whatever it may be. And, and, and we receive a peace that passes understanding and it keeps our our hearts and our minds, it keeps our feelings, our hearts, our cardia healthy. Negative feelings are not healthy. They make you sick. They'll give you ulcers. I remember when dad was a car salesman. He did okay. I mean, my mother, you know, stayed home, took care of us. We lived in a nice little apartment in the Bronx, like all, all our family did. Except dad moved up a step. Okay. He wasn't in an apartment building. He was in a three-family apartment house. And we felt like we were special mm-hmm. because we didn't live in an apartment building. Went to fire escapes where their other relatives. We lived in a, in a house, a three-family house. And we had a backyard. We went out to the yard. And, you know, it was, it was that kind of thing. And it, and, uh, it had pipes running through the... The walls, you know, you can see it on the ceiling running down the walls. And that's just how they made the houses back then. They didn't hide the pipes in the, in the wall. They were right there. They were painted the color of the wall. 
And when the people upstairs flushed, you heard, and you heard going through the pipes. They washed the dishes, you heard going through the pipes. And, and, uh, and you know, and I remember one day we were living on the second story, and the guy downstairs, it was a two, this was a two family home. We were really moving up. <coughs> the owner lived downstairs, and we were just moving the chairs in the kitchen for dinner, and, you know, cleaning up, whatever. And the guy downstairs must have taken a broomstick, and he banged on the ceiling because you could hear the people upstairs. And he did that a couple of times. Well, one day he did it one too many times for my dad. <laughs> dad smacked the chairs. They went flying. He shot like a dart. And he weighed, I don't know, he weighed 250 pounds. He shot like a dart with my mother chasing after him, screaming, no, brother, no. He was called brother. His sister started that. No, brother. And he went, and he started cursing. He busted out the door and he ran downstairs and my mother followed him, we followed him out there. And he went busted out the door. And the guy came down and he got in the guy's face and says, you do that one more time. He says, I'll come down here, I'll break your neck. And he just, the guy was like, he was, he was another young man who was worked in construction. And he was like, the guy was traumatized. And, and he didn't say a word. And my father just told him off and my mother pulling on him. And then he calmed down and he, and he looked at the guy and he said, well, you better not do that, I'm gonna kill you. And he went back upstairs. We never heard anything. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't call the police. They, they didn't, the guy just all of a sudden just never banged up the, the, the floor anymore. I wonder why. And, uh, <laughs> and my dad was, you know, he was a bit nutty there, but. And, uh, and, and I, I was scared to death, but if it was done, I was like, yeah, dad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I think I was about 10. But anyway, uh, why, why did they even tell you that? Where was I going? I was hoping you would never get it. Where was I going? Where was I going with that? Huh? About being anxious and <laughs> worry and fear. That guy downstairs was anxious. He should have just gave it to the Lord. <laughs> but, but, you know. You were the, saying your father like moved up a little bit. And yeah, I know. I don't know why I was saying that. It was good though. But we, we have the pressures of life. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, no wonder Patrice felt sorry for you. About <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? What did she feel sorry for? I think was, she felt, said she was sorry that your parents were getting a divorce. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you people out there watching this, it's none of your business, okay? Come on. But, but anyway, let's go turn with me to Philippians 1. Verse 6, please. Philippians 1, 6, please. Thank you. 1, 6. Yes. Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything. Now here, here is where it keeps our hearts and our minds. Where the thoughts and the emotions. I was talking about feelings, right? Oh, yeah. That God, God is a God of feeling. He feels for us. He's a God of anger. I mean, he has wrath. It talks about he'll pour out his wrath upon the wicked. Yeah. I saw one preacher say, well, that means that he just steps back. No. No. He pours it out. Pours it out, yeah. And he doesn't just step back. He pours it out on the wicked. There's coming a day when the wicked will face an angry God and they'll be judged. Yeah. Uh, hell is not just stepping back. Hell is pouring out wrath. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, um, yes. But, but he has heaven for those who are reconciled to him. But he's a God of compassion and love and mercy. And he's slow to anger. And, and he, he has to be slow. Because look what he puts up with in our lives and in the world for all of these years. Yeah. And yet he hasn't destroyed us. Yeah. We're still going on. He, he's patient. He's kind. But he's a God of feelings. He's a God of love. He wants to enjoy you. We are created for his good pleasure. Amen. Isn't that interesting? That's what it says. We are created to give God pleasure. He wants to feel good about us. He calls us his children. Why is that? Because he has warmth in his heart. And we receive the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto, to, to him. We're born again uh, by the Spirit of God. He, he inhabits us by his Spirit in order uh, to bless us, to empower us, to train us. Because he has a plan for us. And these plans give him delight. They, 
He delights in, in helping us and blessing us. He has a future for us. He has an inheritance for us. Who do you give an inheritance to? Someone you love. Your children, right? He has an inheritance for us that is reserved in heaven that fades not away. It is an inheritance that cannot be used up because God feels for us. Uh, he understands us. He feels for us. And Christ was tempted in every point like we are, yet without sin. And he is touched with the feelings even of our infirmities. It says he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Yeah. Right? He said to Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus had feelings. Yeah. He still has feelings. We have feelings. But it's important that we keep our, our feelings in the feelings of Christ, in the feelings of the Lord. If you're going to have a burden, let it be God's burden upon you. Let it be a burden that the Holy Spirit helps you carry. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and, and are heavy laden. He says, and, and I will give you rest. In me you'll find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And this is what the Lord calls us to do. He wants us to have healthy feelings. That's important. Healthy, peaceful, happy, Amen. calm feelings like of it. joy. This is what the Lord calls us to do. We can only find it in Him. So here is, in verse 6, here is the <clears throat> prescription for that. He says, Be careful in nothing, but in everything by prayer, and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, that you shall keep your, your, your feelings and your thoughts through Christ Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. So here, we have to understand these three words, prayer. Here is the proper way to receive peace as you approach God. He says prayer. This word prayer literally means worship. Why does the Lord start out telling us the first thing that we need to do when we pray is to worship? Well, I, I thought about that a little bit. I asked the Lord to give me a little wisdom about that because first of all, I believe that when we worship, he inhabits the praise, right? Yes. So it brings us immediately into his presence. Number two, when we're worshiping God, we can take our mind off of what's bothering us. We're putting our mind on who he is and, and worshiping and giving thanks to him and praise to him, okay? I mean, Paul and Silas were having a great time at midnight in the prison, singing praises to God. Because no matter where you are, you can be in, in, a, in a large mansion, you can be in the biggest church in America, or you can be in your bathroom, and you can worship God and experience Him the same way. Amen. In His presence. Come into His presence with praise and worship. So important for the Christian's mental health and our and our emotions prayer so we start out in prayer we worship I would suggest that we worship until we feel something okay what does that mean worship until you have a breakthrough into the presence of God Amen. until you break through into the presence of God now I don't know about you but when I start worshiping all of a sudden my heart just melts and the tears start coming and uh Sometimes when I'm home alone jogging, I'll worship the Lord. It just, you know, it, it, it kind of helps me to be moving when I when I pray. I've always been like that. I like to walk back and forth when I pray. When I'm jogging, I'm praying. I start thinking on the goodness and the greatness of God, and I'll worship Him and I'll praise Him, and and I start to to weep before the presence of the Lord. It, it is the most satisfying, healing experience to be able to come and weep with gratefulness to God. And to praise Him. You connect with Him. Everything starts to seem better at that point. Doesn't it? All your troubles begin to fade away because you realize that you're in the presence of God who loves me and cares for me. Mm -hmm. If God before you, the scripture says, if God before you, who can be against you? Amen? Amen? Amen. So we start out with worship. Uh, sometimes we have to start out with repentance in worship. Mm -hmm. And you can repent with worship. Okay? And you praise and worship, come before the Lord, and you bow down before Him, and you confess you're falling short, and you praise Him, and you give thanks to Him and for His mercy. And you confess. Confess is part of worship because you're acknowledging that He is the Savior, 
that he's a redeemer, that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that he's able to change us. Amen. So we worship God and we praise him and we give thanks to him. We come into his presence till we get a breakthrough. Then at that point, we go to supplication. Let your request be made known. Uh, let your prayer and supplicate, let everything, I'm sorry, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication means petition. That means, what scripture are you at? I'm in verse 6. Of Philippians chapter 4. four. Okay. Did I say 1? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 4. Uh, <clears throat> supplication means petition. It means to make known your needs. You have to make known your needs. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, you know, sometimes we share our needs with one another. We pray you work for another. The Bible says that we may be healed. It's okay to share our, our needs with one another. But listen, the first person we go to is, is the Lord. Amen. And then sometimes we, after you go to the Lord, you don't have to tell anybody else. You know, sometimes the Lord will say, you know, go and pray with this one. He'll even direct us. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I, I, I tell the Lord stuff, and I don't want to tell anybody else. I just want it to be between me and the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because sometimes you share a need with people, and you add their doubt to it. <laughs> uh, a lot of times I don't even like to talk about things to people that I'm going through. Because I don't want them to start thinking, oh, man, the pastor's in trouble. You know, he's, he's going to die <laughs> whatever. I don't even say it. So a lot of times I won't even tell my wife of things in the past. Why? Because I don't want her worrying about me because worry is not going to help me. Amen. Worry is a waste. It's a waste. And, uh, and I don't want to burden her with it. But we bring our, we bring our petitions, <laughs> our supplications, our needs, our requests to the Lord. And there we, we give it to him. We know that he hears us. And so we, we, spend, we spend time in worship. We've connected with worship. We're in the presence of the Lord. Our heart is melted before his, his glory and his wonder. We then bring our needs before him. We know we, that, that we have his ear because he heard our praise and he responded to us. Because let me tell you, your heart never melts in, when you're worshiping God unless God is responding to your worship. It's not, a, it's not a natural thing, okay? It is a supernatural experience when you all of a sudden sense the sweetness of God on you when he's touching you in return for worshiping him, okay? He inhabits the praise, and he touches you where? In your spirit, in your heart, mm -hmm. and then you unload your mind, and you tell him what you're thinking, where the needs are. You make a request known. Then it says, you let these requests, these petitions, this supplication, with, be made known with thanksgiving. Okay? And we have to be careful that we don't get too mechanical about that. Because we know, well, I know I'm supposed to pray this. Okay, Lord, I praise you, I worship you, Lord. Here's my need, Lord. You've got to help me because I'm going to die. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Not too, not too mechanical about it. We have to worship until it's real worship. Je Jesus said that the Father <clears throat> seeks the worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. In spirit and in truth. He wants us to worship him until we connect. Uh, he says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what the Father is looking for. Why do you think God is looking for worshipers? Is it so that he can feel good about himself? The devil will tell you that. God's just a big you know, egomaniac, and he just wants everybody to look at him and you know, tell him nice things about himself. Not so. No. He wants you to express your, your gratitude and your love, and my gratitude my love towards him. He wants us to express how we feel about him. I'm very, very in awe of someone who created me. True. Amen. And everything that I experience in life, and all the people I know, and, and I, I, sometimes when I'm jogging and worshiping the Lord, I start thinking about the creation. How there are hundreds of billions of galaxies filled with stars. And that we are just a little tiny speck in the center of a universe that is so large that our minds can't possibly imagine. What kind of a huge God he is. And I think, well, God, how could you see me? How do you even know me? How can my thoughts ever reach you, this giant God who creates all these things? Then I remember, remember, but he's also the God 
of the atom and the molecules and the parts of the atom and the protons and the neutrons and the, every electron that, that travels through every atom that's out there going from, I mean, he's the God who keeps everything, the big galaxies and then all of the little molecules. Every, he upholds all things by the word of his power. And then I realized, God, you do see me because you are holding together all of the atoms in my body. You have created the ability to think and to have thoughts. Amen. You, you in, in, invented these things. You created the feelings that I feel. Mm -hmm. Lord, you're the God who gave, gave me the ability to get stressed out about stuff. <laughs> you're the God who gave me the ability to feel your love and compassion, to have joy. You, you created me with the ability to have faith, hope, and love. Amen. These are all of you. And you made me in your image like this. You didn't make Venus or Mars or Alpha, whatever star out there, in your image like this. You made me in your image like this. You didn't make Michael or Lucifer or Gabriel in your image like this. You made us. Yeah. And Jesus wasn't made like an angel. He came and he became one of us. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And you really are my father. And I start to think of these things. My faith rises up. And I realize he does know me. Right now, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. He, he does know us. Amen. He knows us. Yes, he does. He knows us. He's aware of our every need. He cares about everything about us. And he's a God who feels. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. And, and we can then bring our petitions before him and do it with gratefulness, with gratitude. Gratitude is the language of faith. Yes, it it's the expression of believing that you have received what you have petitioned for. And I, and I want to tell you what, what, I, what I personally do. I'm not telling you how to do it. But once I pray through on something and I've given it to the Lord, I don't do it again. Because I'm not, I feel like that if I, this is how I pray. Okay, I'm not telling you how to do it. Sometimes people have to pray until they get a victory in their, in their prayer. But once I know that I have come into the presence of God and and given him my petition, I don't go back to it again. Because I know that he has it already. Amen. And I'm not going to go there and remind him of something because he doesn't forget. Okay. Already done. He does not forget. And I'm not going to show him that I'm doubting him. That's right. Not doubt. Once I, once, listen, when I prayed about the salvation of my parents. Once I knew that I can claim Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, and I claim my father, my mother, my brother, and my grandparents for the kingdom of God, they were going to be saved. I claimed it based on that. I never asked them again to save them. Never did again. They were still the same old ornery cusses. You know what I'm saying? But I never asked them again. I just believed it. I just believed it. I just believed it. And what did I do? I would think about it. And I was thinking about how nasty they'd get. And then, but then I knew they were going to be saved. And I would just get happy and thank them. They don't know what I know. Right. I knew before they knew. Mm -hmm. And so the day that Dad said, hey, let's go to church. <coughs> after he moved to Florida, you want to go with me? I said, sure, Dad. <laughs> and we went over to a Faith, uh, what was the name of that church? Faith Church? Faith Church of Hialeah. Uh, and, and the preacher was uh, Alessi. Pastor Alessi. What was his first name? Paul Alessi was the preacher. He had just come back from Rome. I know I'm going a little longer here, but just a couple of minutes. He had just come back from visiting Rome, and, and he had just been there uh, where, what do the Catholics have in Rome? Vatican. Vatican. He just gone to the Vatican. So he came back with stories of Rome and the Vatican, and then, and then he started to uh, question some of the, the Catholic doctrines that were not scriptural. And I'm thinking to myself, well, my parents are Catholic. Well, what do I care because all I know is that when I get in heaven and walk on the streets of glory, they're going to be there. So if they get out of here mad and walk out on him because of what he's saying, I'm not worried about it because I know they're saved. Then, then he turned to the gospel and started preaching the straight gospel of Jesus Christ, how to be saved. You don't need a priest. You don't need a nun. You don't need a pope. You just need Jesus. And he gave the invitation to accept Christ. And, and sure enough, my dad raised his hand. Then my mom saw him, and I just looked away, and she raised her hand. They went down, they accepted the Lord, and, and that was it for Dad. That, I mean, this, he went totally all in. Yes. And, and, I, and I used to hear my mother yell at him, you got to stop this tithing, we can't afford this. 
And he says, shut up, Vivian. <laughs> things, things don't change over things don't change overnight. But dad make it, went from making in the twenty thousands, because that's what the pay was, it wasn't bad back then, to to well over a hundred thousand a year. And, and became a vice president in his company. He said, I've tithe what I want to make. And he would move up to that. And dad dad went all in. Uh, Pastor Browning used to say, you know, God don't have you all until he's got your, your wallet too. But that dad, he went all the way. And he was the guy that paid off our church building over there. Yes. The guy that said, if I ever uh, catch you preaching in the street, I'll kill you. And he says, what are you going to those churches for? All they want is your money. Uh. <laughs> and and he, he gave more than any person ever gave to our church. And, and he lived comfortably. But, but let me tell you, though, uh, I knew they were going to get saved. I didn't have to ask again. I didn't have to pray for him again. I just thanked God. Right. I thanked him joyously. I wasn't thanking the Lord. Okay, Lord, you see, I'm thanking you now. I'm thanking you. This is faith, so you got to do it. See, Lord, I'm having faith. Come on, God. When? You know, I'm not, it's not like that. I, I was thanking, Lord, I, I don't have to ever see it. If it's on his deathbed, I don't care. I know that I know that I know. But I got to see it, and Dad became an elder in our church. He preached in our church, and he became a wonderful man of God. And my mother, too, loved the Lord. God answers prayer. You got to believe it. You got to receive it. But you make your request. You, you worship till you break through. Then you lay what's on your heart. You know, even more with, with more feeling when you're in the presence of the Lord than you can when you're just thinking about it. When your heart's in it too. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When you get fervent about things, it, it goes a long way. Yeah. Amen? It's true. It becomes more effective. Fervency. <laughs> when we pray in the very presence of God and we give thanks in a grateful language. That's what thanksgiving is. It means speaking words of gratitude. It's grateful language. You take your gratitude and you express it with grateful language. And, and, uh, and so we sandwich expressing needs with praise and worship. And then we petition uh, with grateful language. We give thanks for receiving it. And then, and then it says the peace of God. Now, the peace of God, says, which passes all understanding, <clears throat> shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what is the peace of God? The peace of God is what we're to experience when we're waiting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what we do when we wait. Mm -hmm. You have peace. Peace. Uh, <clears throat> Listen, I remember having my heart in a place where I couldn't walk to the bathroom without thinking that this could be it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and my wife was there, and I'd have to walk real slow to the bathroom and, and uh, yeah. come out of there. It got, it got real bad like that the last few days. It's amazing I didn't have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor said I could have dropped dead. I had 90% blockage in the main artery to my heart. They call it the widow maker. Uh, he says three things happen. He says people just drop dead or they have a terrible heart attack and live, or they, like you, catch it before anything happens. So God, God, God was good to me. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, but I but I can remember you know barely being able to walk across the room, but, but being at peace. And if it wasn't for that peace, I probably would have had a heart attack. Because honey, I wasn't I wasn't in the slightest way distressed. I wasn't upset. I was just careful not to overexert myself so I don't die. You know you know what I'm saying. And then when we went into the hospital and I I stayed there and they kept me there for a few days and. Waiting for it, I was I'm not distressed. I, I got to tell, you know, some of the, the the hospital workers about the things of the Lord and the guy doing the ultrasound on me, and I was telling him what his name meant, uh, and, and then and then started telling him about the Lord. I think his name was uh, Raphael. Raphael, yeah, uh -huh. Raphael. That was his name. And then afterwards, in the recovery room, they had to pull tubes out of my chest. You know, they do that after, and one of them was stuck. And the other lady was there, and it was stuck, and she's pulling it, and then she gives it this big tear, bam, and it came, comes tearing out, and she got covered in my blood. And, and, uh, and I want to tell you, it was kind of like getting stabbed four times. Yeah, but I, I, I just don't react too much. And she goes, that didn't hurt? 
I said, well, yeah, it wasn't too bad, though. She goes, but you wouldn't want to do that every day. I said, no, I would not want to do that every day. <laughs> and I said, don't, don't you worry about it. I said, I don't, I, they took my blood. I don't have any herpes or hepatitis of any kind. She goes, that is a relief. But somebody told me they know this before they go in there. But it was a relief. But, but you don't have to be stressed. You're going through stuff like this, so you go through it, you know. And... Uh, and the Lord is with you. He walks us through these things. He is with us. And we give thanks and we're grateful. And I told stories to the, to the nurses, uh, you know, uh, about serving the Lord and about preaching in different places and miracles I've seen them do. And, uh, and then they moved me to a regular room. And Dave and Tiana came to visit me. And one of the nurses came down and running looking for her. Oh, there you are. And she came running into the to the room and say, hi, how you doing? Uh, you know, and I said, David, I introduced him. This is my son, David, his wife, Tiana. And she was just kind of there saying, well, you know, you know I, I didn't have anything else to say at that time. So, said, okay, good to see you. You know, God bless you. And she went her way. But, it, you know, you can, you can turn anything into an adventure for God. The Lord is with you. So we stand with the peace of God. It's peace which is sourced in and given by God. And, and it says, and listen to what it says here, and I'm going to end with this. It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It keeps your feelings and your thoughts. It passes understanding. And, and here's what it says. In the original language, it actually means this. It causes us to rise above anxious thoughts. It passes, that's, that's what it says, passes understanding. We literally rise above the thoughts that make us anxious. Okay? Because it's our thoughts in 30 seconds that turn into feelings that bring anxiety. But it's a peace that rises above thoughts that make us anxious. And, and it keeps our hearts and our minds right with them in the presence of God where we have the joy and the peace. Higher and superior to our understanding, to our hearts, our feelings, and our emotion, our thinking. It's God's peace. Amen? Amen. And so we all need to, living in this 21st century of stress, we all need to access what we, we have available to us in the Lord. Amen. Worship and supplication and thanksgiving and approach Him with faith, hope, and love. And realize that God wants you to feel good. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you a sense of joy and peace. As a matter of fact, it's the fruit of His Spirit. He wants to fill you with his love. He wants to give you his love and his joy and his peace. And that's, that's the gift that God gives to us. And if you're not experiencing that today, I kind of wish we had a piano here, you know, it kind of, music kind of enhances the feel of the moment. But if you're not a, a, experiencing that today, it, it's available yes. to all of us. Yes, it is. We just have to uh, take it to the Lord, you know. There, there was an old song. Uh, what was that song, Therese? you got to help me. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs, all our griefs, sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We've got to carry it to Him. Carry it to Him. Give it to Him. I know, that, I know that there are people in here that have issues. Man, we do, you know. Maybe right up there with Paul's issues, except in a different way. But he, he, the God of Paul will be the God of you. And he loves you and he'll care for you. Let's stand. I want to pray for you right now. I believe that the Lord will, will hear and that he will respond. I'm going to pray for you that God will touch your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are almighty God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you've created all things, that you are, uh, you are the creator of the Bible. Elohim, Genesis 1.1. You created the heavens and the earth. You're the judge of it all. You saw that it was good. 
And you've given us hearts and understanding of minds, Lord, in your image. And we can see and we know what's good and what's not good. And Lord, some of the things in our life are good and some of the things are not good. And so, Lord, we thank you that there's nothing impossible for you. Your word says that with God all things are possible. And so, Father, we just come before your very capable, almighty presence, your enduring presence, Lord. You, you, you're you're a, a, a fire that never stops burning, Lord. You're a presence that never ceases, Lord. You fill the universe with yourself, Lord. Your Holy Spirit is within us, Lord, in this very room, Lord. And there's nothing, Lord, that is hid from your eyes or, or that is uh, not being heard by your ears, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord God, for tending to your precious people here today, Lord. In Jesus' name. And Lord God, we lift up all of the needs that we all have individually, Lord, concerning health and finances and family and the state of mind and relationships and marriages, Lord, and, and all of these things, Lord. We, we lift them up before you, Lord, and we give them to you, Lord, because you're the source of every good and perfect gift. It all comes down from the Father of lights, as your word says, with whom there is no... Uh, shadow of turning Lord. and Lord you're the same yesterday and today and forever and Lord I pray that you'll open the windows of heaven that are here today Lord and that Lord you'll pour out your blessings Lord pour out healings Lord God pour out provision in the name of Jesus uh, and I, I just have to share something w with you yesterday I was praying and I was feeling a little stressed about financial things and and I said, Lord, just give me a word. Whatever you tell me, I'm going to trust in you. I went and I told my wife immediately what happened. I said, Lord, I'm just going to open my Bible. I'm going to look down. And, and Lord, I ask it. You know, listen, I, I believe God will do that, but you better be in his presence when you try it. Yeah. And, uh, but he does it. And I opened the scripture, and if you can believe for it, God will do it. And I looked down, and it said, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah. And all of my tension and stress about financial things left me because God said that he would do it yes. and, and that's that's his word and Lord we just cast all of our financial cares upon you Lord and, uh, of health and things Lord and Lord we, we pray for direction Lord for those who need wisdom Lord we ask you for wisdom Lord because your word says if any man lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all men freely and doesn't scold them for asking so grant wisdom Lord, to all of us who need direction and wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we, we put the future of this church into your hands, Lord. It's already there. But we thank you, Lord, that you got it covered. We thank you, Lord, for fruitfulness that is coming more than we have ever seen in our past. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for sending laborers into the harvest. For the field is white and ready for harvest, Lord. Lord, we offer ourselves as those laborers to, to work in that field, Lord. Use us, Lord, for your glory. We pray for our families, Lord, for kids and parents and loved ones and, and uh, spouses, Lord, and friends, Lord, those that have needs, Lord. All those petitions that we raised up earlier, Lord, we thank you, God, that your ears are open, that you hear, that you're the living God. You're not just religion, Lord. You're not a religion. You're the living God. You're the creator. And we praise you. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. You're Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who supplies all of our needs. You're Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who, who hears, Lord, and knows, Lord. You're Jehovah Shalom, the God our peace, the Lord our peace. Lord, you're Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. You make us to lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside the still waters. You restore our soul. You lead us in the paths of righteousness. For your namesake, and yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For, Lord, you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, and our cup runs over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all of the days of our life, and we will dwell in your house forever. Thank you, Lord. You're Jehovah Nisi, Lord. Your banner over us and over our families is love, Lord. You fight our battles, Lord God. You watch over our children, Lord God. Lord, you're the God, Lord, of our defense, Lord. You're the Lord of hosts, the, the, the Lord Sabaoth, Lord. We thank you, Lord, 
that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you're the captain of all of the armies of heaven, Lord. We praise you and we thank you and give you glory, Lord, that you fight for us, Lord, that no weapon formed against us will prosper in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, that they can't take anything from us. And we don't fear those who can kill the body, Lord. But Lord, we look to you who saves the soul and the body and the spirit in your kingdom. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that we are firmly in your hand. No man will pluck us out of your hand, Lord, because we trust in you, Lord. We believe in you and we follow you, Lord, with all of our hearts. We thank you, Lord. Lord, grant peace to those who have trouble sleeping, Lord. We rebuke that insomnia in the name of Jesus. If those have pain in their body, we rebuke that pain in the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. For those who are saddened, Lord, I rebuke a spirit of depression, Lord God, and melancholy. In Jesus' name, replace it, Lord God, Lord, with anointing oil of joy. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Lord, anoint us all with your joy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let the spirit of the living God just move among our families, Lord, and bring joy unspeakable, full of glory, full of your presence, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. We bless your name. Hallelujah. We give you thanks, Lord. Lord, you are Jehovah Tzidkanu. Lord, we have received your righteousness through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been imparted to us. And, Lord, you, you are not holding our, our sins to us, Lord God, because we have been reconciled to you through the redemptive blood and sacrifice of Jesus and by his resurrection we're alive unto you. And we thank you, Lord God, that we have imputed righteousness. Not our righteousness, but the Son of God has given to us his righteousness. And we receive it. We believe you for it. We don't doubt it. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, you are Jehovah Mekedesh, or Mekedeshka, as some say. Lord, we are, you are the Lord, our sanctification. You're working in us, Lord, to bring us into the image of Christ and conform us to him and make us more like Jesus every day and every minute, Lord, every year, every decade. Lord, we thank you and we praise you that we're being changed in, from glory to glory and from faith to faith, Lord. We bless you and we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I pray for those who have drifted who are discouraged, who are not in church like they need to be. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray, God, that you will meet them where they're at, Lord. Show them your kindness, Lord, and your tender mercies. Bring restoration, Lord. Bring, uh, Lord, a, a restoring of their love for you, Lord. Deliver all of your people from lukewarmness, Lord. Put the fire back in, Lord, God. Put the love back in. Love that covers a multitude of sins, Lord. Some people get mad at the members. They get mad at the preacher. But, Lord, love covers a multitude of sins. Lord, give us a love that helps us to look at each other with not critical eyes, Lord, but, but eyes of compassion and mercy and love, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord God, so that we can uh, work together to achieve your purposes, Lord, in the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that there will be patience in the families between the spouses, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Help us to rejoice with the wives of our youth, Lord God, and be always ravished with their love, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for them, for the gift that they are to us, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord, and I praise you for all the blessings that you've so abundantly bestowed yes. upon us, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and we can just go on. Thank you for speech, Lord. Thank you for thoughts. Thank you, Lord, for the hot and the cold, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the, the, the clear water. Water is such an amazing thing. Here's this liquid that is pure and clear, and, and it makes up a lot of our body, and it's so available when we drink it. It's just amazing what God has given to us. We're going to have the living water one day. The living will drink that water and will never thirst again and will never die. One day we'll partake of the tree of life that's in the garden of God and we'll never die. And when we see Jesus, we're going to be like he is. And Father, we praise you and we thank you. I better stop because I went over time. But Lord, we give you glory and thanks and honor and praise. Be encouraged, saints. Receive the encouragement of God. Go with the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord.